I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Simon Chantry, co-founder and chief information officer at BIT, which enables central banks, financial institutions, and other stakeholders to deploy, manage, and integrate with digital currencies on payment networks. Simon will be talking to us about central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs, and digital currency management systems. Simon, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jordan, for that introduction. And it's certainly my pleasure to be here with the Stellar Development Foundation and all of our colleagues uh, from Ukraine today. So as Jordan mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CIO of BIT. BIT offers our digital currency management system to central banks and financial institutions worldwide uh, who are looking to either deploy their own CBDC or stablecoin or integrate with CBDCs, stablecoins, and other digital currencies. So what this slide is showcasing is the journey that central banks have been on over the last roughly five years. So what we've seen from central banks is investigation and research <clears throat> initially beginning sort of five years ago with the Bank of England. The Bank of England was the, the first central bank to start researching and publishing material on central bank digital currencies. Uh, central banks have then sort of moved through each of these boxes to get through workshops and public consultation. So in, in, in these phases, the central banks are actually interviewing industry experts, interviewing stakeholders in their economy, and understanding how a digital currency would impact different elements of their economy and the different stakeholders from the central bank departments themselves through to financial institutions, regulators, government, enterprise and business through to retail end users. So the result of the workshops and public consultation typically informs some, some of the discussion and efforts that internal working groups will turn into more of a technical documentation and project plans. So the next step there is internal working groups. And we've seen central banks establish uh, significant internal uh, working groups specifically dedicated to studying digital currency studying how a digital currency could be implemented in their region and beyond. And in some cases, this has been built out into full project teams that uh, may even do some development work in-house and more than just research, but, uh, but also start scoping what a, uh, how their plan would look to digitize their national currency. After these working groups are established, we see uh, central banks move into feasibility study and pilot project phases. So feasibility study can range, it could be a sandboxed software environment where different stakeholders are able to come in and test software related to uh, CBDCs. And just to get a feel for how to operate the system. So as you can imagine, uh, the central bank plays a very key role in the operation and deployment and management of the digital currency uh, system. And I'll speak more about that when I get into some of the tools that, that BIT has built. But during the feasibility study in the pilot project, certainly in the pilot project, when the software is available to more stakeholders, we see uh, uh, extensive efforts ongoing here. And uh, later in the, in the presentation, I will showcase uh, just how many countries are actually in pilot at this point and, uh, and how those, those pilot projects are going. After pilot, of course, we get into live deployment and operationalization. And this is where the central bank digital currency network is open to the public for use, open to all different stakeholders in the economy. And the operating model is, is basically established for the CBDC network. So this is the journey that we've seen central banks go through. Now, central banks are at different stages in this journey, depending on who we're speaking about. So in the Caribbean, we've had some very progressed uh, central banks in the Bahamas and the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, who's our client. Uh, the ECCB went live with their CBDC in a pilot project at the end of March of this year. Bahamas was before that. 
Uh, and so we're seeing sort of this pilot project uh, live deployment stage already come about and in, in different areas in the world as well. We know that China is very far progressed uh, and some other countries in Southeast Asia. Recently, we've seen indications from the, the Fed and the European Central Bank that a CBDC will be forthcoming sort of within the next four years. And they've already begun the, uh, the efforts of, uh, uh, of, of bringing that into reality. So here's a timeline on this slide of some of the contributing factors that have led central banks to look to digitize their currency. It's also led to the emergence of stable coins um, in a number of different forms. So uh, it, I, I believe that the Bitcoin white paper, if we look all the way to the left, we see the Bitcoin white paper came out at the end of 2008. And this really was a seminal moment for uh, digital currencies in general. And uh, I was speaking at Consensus this morning about the significance of, uh, of the launch of Bitcoin and the evolution of cryptocurrency, of virtual currency, and how central banks have effectively been monitoring the open source developments of cryptocurrency and recognize that they have the ability to take elements of that open source movement and financial institutions included, and apply it to their own use cases. And that's particularly CBDCs and stable coins. So we see the Bitcoin white paper come out and, uh, and the emergence of digital currencies, private digital currencies um, really sort of progressed over the last decade. Um, in, the, in the bottom left-hand box, you sort of show a number of the, uh, of the projects that happened sort of uh, between then and 2019, and that's Project Jasper with the Bank of Canada. We have Ubin with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Lion Rock with Hong Kong, Bank of Thailand, uh, South African Reserve Bank, et cetera. Uh, another big contributing factor here was Libra, or still is Libra, now called DM, and that's the digital currency project that's associated with Facebook. So the Libra white paper came out in June of 2019, and it sort of also gave central banks uh, a bit of a, and financial institutions a bit of a wake up call that no longer was it just open source uh, private virtual currencies, but that also large multinational organizations could use this technology to roll out digital currency systems. And so I would say the Libra white paper and the efforts of Facebook and the Libra Association, now DM Association, um, also sort of spurred regulators to um, perhaps pay more attention to the emergence of digital currencies, private digital currencies. And uh, certainly that was indicated with the G7 working group releasing their paper on, uh, on digital currencies and so-called stable coins, I believe they named it. Uh, and that was a very thorough paper on the value proposition of stable coins and where, you know, uh, why they've come about and how people are recognizing that they can use basically internet native payment rails um, to cut down on settlement times and settlement costs and have easier access to really powerful digital financial services. Um, one of the things uh, that predates these events, however, is the uh, the People's Bank of China. They began a working group on digitizing uh, the renminbi back in 2013, I believe, or 2014. And so they were very early to study this technology and to uh, try and establish a roadmap for how they would digitize their currency. And now we know that if we you know, fast forward uh, to April 2020, uh, they're piloting that digital currency with four banks and three telcos, I believe in four major cities. And it's set to go live uh, at the Olympics, the next Olympics, which I believe is in 2022. Um, so People's Bank of China is certainly pushing forward uh, and have been doing so for, for many years now on, uh, on the digitization of currency. Uh, a few other events in here, we have the digital dollar project announced in the US. And we have the World Economic Forum coming out with the uh, Digital Currency Con uh, Governance Consortium, uh, which I'm proud to be a member of. Um, we also have, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the Sand Dollar being launched in Bahamas. And then, of course, our client, we're very excited to have launched the, uh, 
the digital EC dollar called Dcash in March of 2021. So here's a map of uh, all the CB, uh, central bank digital currency pilot projects that are ongoing right now. And what I wanted to do was just bring up the um, Atlantic Council's CBDC tracker. So this is a great tool for any of you who are looking to uh, who are looking to understand where all of the pilot projects are, like the, their status worldwide. So if you go to AtlanticCouncil.org and, and you can search uh, Atlantic Council CBDC tracker, you'll see, and you can hover over each of these uh, countries. Let me just see, my mouse is not as responsive. Oh, here we are. So Canada status in development, and you can see it's all color coded very nicely. And we can see uh, what status each of these countries are in. So we know Norway's in research. They actually just released a, a great paper on the research they've been doing. We know that Sweden is actually progressing fairly quickly. A lot of this is based on consumer demand and they are typically progressive. Uh, so they're in orange, that means they're in pilot phase. Uh, we can see that uh, China is also in pilot phase. Uh, Saudi Arabia, pilot, same thing with Thailand. Uh, you know, we can see Ghana here is in research. Um, we, we know that Brazil is in development. Same thing with, with Venezuela. Uh, we do have Ukraine here in pilot because of the previous pilot that was uh, that was done. Of course, Singapore, or sorry, South Korea, also in pilot phase. And there's some more information that just came out this week on uh, on what's happening in South Korea. So again, just a, a really great uh, a really great map for anybody who's interested in getting an understanding of the, just the CBDC projects and movements that are going on. Uh, internationally here. So I'll close that out and, and return back to uh, my slides here. Okay. All right, so why don't we get into some of the opportunities? And I think a lot of these are common for both central banks, sorry, these are central bank problems. We'll get into opportunities next. So some of these are common for payment systems in general, but some of them more so apply to a monetary authority. Uh, and this, so this can equate both for central banks who are operating a CBDC system, as well as financial institutions who are operating a stablecoin system. So some of these are, are transferable. So number one, cost of cash. Uh, Cost of cash, are, uh, they obviously rear their head in quite a few different places. So we have cost of minting, distribution, security, transportation, counterfeit detection, uh, and operating costs and more. And a lot of these emerge as you speak with businesses. We've spoken with a lot of businesses who are onboarding to digital currency systems. And, uh, and so we see a lot of sort of the hidden costs of cash. Now, most of the central banks we've spoken to are not uh, outright attempting to eliminate cash. They are rather seeing what the market is demanding. So as I mentioned in Sweden, uh, or I, I believe I mentioned this, the, uh, the consumer base is less and less using cash. And so there's more of an immediate demand to upgrade payment systems and move towards fully digitized systems. Whereas in other countries, cash is still in quite high use. So it's, it's effectively meant to be complementary to cash, both CBDCs and stable coins. Uh, so there's problems in clearing and settlement, whether we're talking about PVP or DVP, we know that there's current systemic inefficiencies and these can result in high latency and costly transactions. Um, they're basically sources of friction within markets where uh, you need sometimes days to settle these different transactions. And so we know that with the proper technology underpinnings, we can have instant settlement across different, like multiple currency networks, and not just currency networks, but also securities. So as securities become tokenized, we can exchange between CBDCs and stable coins and securities very quickly with very little cost. Lack of access to data. So certainly getting access to data 
uh, is a challenge probably across the board in most industries, especially as we see the internet continue to evolve and evolve and be used for all kinds of different things. And so standardizing where our economic data is coming from and giving central bankers and financial institutions the data that they need to either assess the what's going on in the economy and how to act appropriately, whether it's for interest rates or transaction limits or um, funding requirements. There's all kinds of different economic analyses that can be garnered from uh, from uh, modern systems. And so I would say the lack of access to data is another problem that's faced by uh, central banks and financial institutions. Some of the opportunities, uh, as I mentioned, gaining, gaining access to this data and then combining it with machine learning uh, basically presents a massive opportunity to monitor for systemic risk, to analyze, predict, and respond to economic movements as they occur in real time, especially given that these currency networks are fully programmable. Uh, it represents major, major opportunities. I mentioned currency exchange and the ability to really seamlessly convert between CBDCs and stable coins and digital currencies, largely based on the technology that's underpinning them. So that's why developing the technology collaboratively across the world using common standards and using some of the open source uh, uh, initiatives that we've seen is paramount to getting the sort of uh, frictionless financial system that uh, that many of us have envisioned uh, that, that can be achieved to safeguard monetary stability and sovereignty yeah, I believe that financial institutions and central banks uh, are, are keen to provide a safe and efficient and secure alternative to private digital currencies and cryptocurrencies. So there's, uh, again, I think the market will dictate uh, elements of, uh, of what tools are best suited for what use cases. But over the past decade, I think the central banks, and certainly over the last five years, the central banks have recognized that if they adopt some of this technology, they can upgrade the capabilities and the user experience of their own currency and provide value in uh, in their region and in their markets. Increased payment uh, competition. This is a big one for payment service providers and financial institutions, um, especially in the context of CBDCs, where you have a digital currency network that's deployed to market that payment service providers can integrate into for the purpose of providing mobile wallets and, and different payment services to end users. Uh, and so this reduces the cost structure for those payment service providers, uh, because whereas in the past they would have been responsible for maintaining user balances and processing transactions and settling transactions, now they simply need to plug in via API to a stablecoin or to a central bank digital currency network, and, uh, and, and they are simply responsible for user-facing um, activities. KYC onboarding, uh, providing a value add application that's user friendly, having good customer support, uh, and providing compelling payment services uh, to the end users. So it decreased their cost structure by removing what's traditionally been required. And then it allows them to take advantage of the technological advancements in these internet native payment networks. So just a summary slide here on unlocking the potential of CBDCs. So as I mentioned, this is fully programmable money. And so I see a lot of opportunity for automated public payments, both incoming and outgoing, different designated payment types. So being able to tag wallets per a certain industry or region, and, uh, and then also internally being able to tag wallets that are uh, sp specific to a particular use case and, and really leaning into the smart contract capabilities and programmable capabilities of this uh, of these modern um, monetary networks. Micropayments, I think, represent a huge opportunity for enabling new business models. So because the cost structure of these networks is meant to be very, very low, if not for some participants, it will be free. Uh, where I think we will see micropayments uh, emerge and enable really modern economic models and business models. 
And this could include the machine to machine transactions uh, that have been discussed in terms of the internet of things. I'm sure many of you have probably heard this term, internet of things. Uh, and so I think that combination, micropayments, machine to machine transactions, we're going to see some really interesting economic models come out of uh, CBDCs, stable coins, and virtual currencies and cryptocurrency uh, payment networks. Certainly direct benefits payments are a use case that's been touted internationally. Uh, the first uh, version of the CARES Act, which was uh, the first act that came through uh, the US in response to uh, the need for uh, COVID relief, uh, financial stimulus. It had provisions for a digital US dollar in it and uh, it didn't make it through the, the final version of the CARES Act, but uh, we can tell that uh, even, you know, um, countries as large as the US with economies of that size and the Federal Reserve obviously playing such a key role as it does, um, considering a, a US dollar, a digital US dollar for benefits payments specifically. And, and I think there's a number of arguments as to why it would be a, a good payment rail for that. Um, other network level integrations that uh, I think we'll see coming, CBDCs and stable coins into other CBDCs and stable coins, into securities networks as securities get tokenized, uh, into other digital currencies, getting integrated into supply chain finance, absolutely, uh, and more. So to speak with you a little more about what we've built, built at BIT over the last uh, five or six years, we've built what's called the BIT Digital Currency Management System. And BIT basically through the DCMS, we enable the operationalization of central bank digital currencies and stable coins throughout the economy. So we've built applications that suit each one of the stakeholders that you see here in this middle column so at the central bank level or digital currency issuer level, we have sort of secure cloud infrastructure, secure minting hardware security module, digital currency management system, monitoring and reporting. So the ability to achieve your entire institutional mandate as a monetary authority using our software protocol. Uh, at the next level, we have licensed financial institutions who are looking to integrate into a CBDC network or issue their own stable coin. And this enables them to uh, basically interact with these digital currency networks, both for their own institutional transaction purposes, as well as for all of their clients. So we've developed solutions for government merchants and consumers, and we basically white label or we license those solutions to financial institutions so that they can take powerful payment applications to market. So they can take, for example, a fully packaged mer merchant solution to brick and mortar merchants, to online merchants for e-commerce and enable them to accept digital currencies for goods and services. And so the licensed financial institution can brand these, these uh, payment applications per their brand and roll them out to market. Similar with the consumer at the, uh, at the bottom here, we have a really powerful mobile wallet that can integrate into stablecoin and CBDCs and digital currency networks. And the financial institutions can turn around and offer that in market uh, to their retail clients. Similarly, we've built solutions for government. Uh, this is for things like collecting payments online for government services, collecting payments in person for government services and tax collection as well and then giving governments the ability to distribute payments. So benefits payments or COVID relief payments, <clears throat> um, tax rebates, so on and so forth. So having effectively a, a government interface um, that enables them to, uh, to both accept and send digital currency payments. So some of the design principles that we've kept in mind in designing and deploying the digital currency management system is sort of a product appearance and behavior uh, to integrate with the functions that we know are required in market. So how can we ensure that each of these stakeholders have all the functions that they require when integrating and operating a digital currency? Uh, it needs to be able to integrate with existing platforms and networks. So digital currency networks will not succeed as standalone systems. They need to be able to integrate with the existing financial system, the existing economy, and so we've designed it with that in mind. 
We've also incorporated customizable governance structures. So when I say governance structures, I mean, there are a number of different actions that can be taken by these stakeholders that require approval by more than one uh, person in the organization. So you can imagine if you're minting a new CBDC or you're minting like a, a lot of CBDC and, uh, or a stable coin for that matter, you may very well need more than one person to sign off on that action. And there's really robust technical solutions on how to do that. So things like multi-signature cryptography, uh, having M of N approval, uh, these sorts of things. So we've basically enabled clients to have customizable governance structures to make sure that their own organizational structure is maintained and any hierarchy within it for, for uh, performing these sorts of actions can be achieved on the platform. So integration with identity and AML compliance solutions, absolutely. We want these solutions to be fully compliant in terms of international and, and certainly regional AML compliance requirements. So uh, we've designed it with, uh, with that in mind and it's currently integrated with uh, an international AML compliance service provider. Uh, having consistent product standards, interfaces, styles and terms, of course, user experience is very, very important. And we want to provide a very powerful and yet simple user experience so that it doesn't require a computer science degree to transact in digital currencies. It should be very simple and very straightforward. And then of course, data privacy management through data partitioning. So there's some concern about publicly identifiable information about a personally identifiable information, sorry, getting out uh, and being on a transaction network. We, we recognize the importance of segregating all personally identifiable information from any transaction network. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why. So we take data privacy and security very, very seriously. And, and that's sort of woven into our design considerations. I'll give you a high level overview of our architecture here. Uh, this is an overview of the digital currency management system. And so as you can see, if we start on the left, the minting system is segregated from the core transaction system. So we like to have, we like to respect basically uh, the established best practices for public private key management. And, uh, and that is to basically generate your public private key pairs for any systemically important action. And minting is certainly that in a offline environment. And so we have uh, taken extensive precautions for designing a minting system that, uh, that sort of respects and, and acknowledges the best practices that have already been set uh, for public private key cryptography. In the middle, we have our NUMA, our transaction system, and uh, this is where uh, we can integrate into the underlying transaction network. So see the blockchain and data stores here, this is interchangeable uh, with different transaction networks. So for example, in the Eastern uh, Caribbean, we've integrated with Hyperledger Fabric for the transaction network. And we're really excited to be uh, working with Stellar on integrating with the Stellar network um, as a transaction network. So our digital currency management system, as I mentioned before, it operationalizes these digital currency networks. So we integrate into the core transaction network, and then we put a number of our tools on here. So our APIs, our monitoring tools, central bank tool set, our routing system, our business logic, so these are all the things that central banks and financial institutions require to achieve some of the programmability and the uniqueness of their own digital currency deployment. So what's the currency code? How many decimal places can you divide it to? Um, what are the wallet types that are existing in your system? And do they have transaction restrictions? Are, they, are there tiers that different wallet types can transact against? So you can imagine all of the things that a monetary authority would be concerned with. Um, these are all programmable into our, uh, our core transaction system here. Um, all the locks that you see around here, these represent secure connections via API. So we have financial institutions that integrate with the transaction network, KYC providers that securely integrate uh, multi-factor authentication providers, payment service providers, and again, financial institutions here so that they can offer 
the payment applications to market, the payment applications that I mentioned before to market. So this whole system sort of represents what the Bank of England calls a platform model, where licensed, uh, licensed payment service providers and institutions can effectively integrate into these digital currency systems uh, in order to provide payment applications to their end users, their enterprise and retail end users, as well as transact for their own purposes uh, between institutions. So I believe that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. Um, just to, again, just an overview of CBDCs, where we've come, some of the forcing functions, and then how bits of digital currency management system sort of fits in with CBDCs and, uh, and stablecoin operating model. Uh, yeah, but, Jordan, do we have any questions or how do. can I take it from here? Okay. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll throw a, a couple of questions. Thanks so much for all of the, uh, the great information, uh, Simon. So I, I have one question and then I'm gonna combine it with a question uh, from the audience. So um, what has been the feedback of your CBDC deployment in the Eastern Caribbean? And are there challenges, lessons that you feel like would be useful to highlight for the Ukraine and, and thoughts you have on, on the Ukraine's CBDC effort? Yeah, absolutely. The project, I think, like most software projects, the scope can be augmented very easily. And so, as you can imagine, you know, you get to the finish line and then, oh, you know, we actually need this feature as well, or we need this, right? So I would say um, if you, if for, for central banks who have not uh, released software before, at least to the public like this, that is probably, you know, there's some, uh, there's just some new territory there that they need to uh, to understand sort of comes with it, it it comes with the whole process of developing and deploying software and so our digital currency management system provides a really base uh, a really good base uh, layer feature set but inevitably it needs to be configured for the central bank and so we we like to work with the central bank in sort of tailoring the solution to their requirements and so as you can imagine uh, there's there's just so much opportunity in terms of how you can program these systems that you need to treat it like a software release where you define your MVP, you get to market, and then you continue iterating. Software is never done. It will always be, you will always be iterating on this software. And so I would just say to, you know, manage the expectations of understanding what, def what defines your MVP, what use cases are you trying to achieve in your economy and your financial system specifically, where should it integrate? You know, the, all these sorts of things really need to be answered very specifically. But then above and beyond software, you really need a dedicated team for go-to market strategy. This is much different than, uh, than just software development, technical software development and deployment. Uh, go-to market strategy is a large effort and it's multifaceted and it involves things like marketing and user onboarding, education campaigns. So it's a there's a lot that goes into that to making these projects a success. And, and, uh, and as they are sort of encompassing the entire or, or touching many stakeholders in the financial system, I think it makes sense to have a collaborative approach. So yeah, those would be a few of the, the lessons learned that I would uh, pass on. That's great. I can relate to a lot of those things. So uh, thanks so much, Simon. This has been really informative. I'm sure our attendees uh, got a lot out of it. So thanks very much. Thank you, Pl uh, pleasure to be here.